Hey everybody, I want to thank you for coming to uh, Coding 102, DevNet 2003. My name is Brett Tiller. I'm a developer evangelist for uh, DevNet. I've been with Cisco for about 10 years. Uh, this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about who this uh, course is intended for, pretty much everybody, but I'll just kind of talk a little bit of detail about that. I'm going to brief you on what DNA is so you can see how um, APIC-EM controller, which we're going to talk about, ties into that. Uh, I'm going to do a brief recap on Coding 101. I'm assuming that you've taken the Coding 101 course, that you sat through it, or that you've got some very basic development skills. If not, I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you a quick recap just to kind of get you up to speed on that. Uh, just some information about how to get started. So I'm going to give you a set of links, where to go, so you can move forward with your learning, which will be quite useful. We're going to do some Python coding. Uh, this is only a 45 minute course. So you probably won't be writing much Python. I'm going to give you the steps to get going on that, but I'm going to show you some Python examples and how that all works. Okay? And I'll also have an assignment for you that you can, of course, do here if there's time, or you can continue at the learning labs where there's lots of learning you can do over there in our uh, DevNet learning labs as well. And I'll give you some final thoughts, which will be, okay, this is what you've learned. Here's where you need to go next so you can continue that learning process. All right, so the intended audience. So if you're brand new to coding, that's good. You've probably then done Coding 101, or maybe you've done a DevNet Learning Lab. If not, you know, again, I'm going to do a brief review on that stuff, but it would be a great opportunity for you to begin doing so. Again, our DevNet Learning Labs are available here where you can get your questions answered, and they're always available online for you. Uh, returning coder, if you've done coding before, this is a great place to get started again. Right, because I'm going to be talking about Python coding, but maybe you were a Bash shell script, maybe you've done a C coding, maybe you've done C++ or another language. You're going to see how that all ties in together and how it's very easy for you, if you've done coding, to get started with Python development. Uh, net operations, so your network, you're also working with, dev with uh, operations folks. It'll work for you as, as well because we're doing APIC EM, which is a network controller. So you're going to quickly see how that ties in. You'll learn how to write code to use that. DevOps, so if you're a developer and you've been working with ops, you've probably got mostly a developing background. And again, picking up APIC-EM, we've got labs available for you so you can learn about networking and how that all ties together. So whether you've got a development background or just a networking background, we've got labs available and I'm going to cover some of that for you. But again, you continue your learning with our, uh, with our learning labs that are available. So just to get you kind of uh, warmed up about what this is about, so this is um, basically, APIC-EM is about DNA. It's a controller that's based in DNA. So I'm just going to spend just a brief time talking about that. Again, we have labs that will give you more detail about DNA. But basically, DNA works from the inside out. So of course, you're going to have network infrastructure. That work, network infrastructure is going to be virtualized, right? Virtualization lowers TCO, total cost of ownership. So there's lots of that that occurs. There's controllers that sit on top of that, OK? So for example, APIC-EM which is the application interface controller, is one of those. We're going to talk about that today. Another one would be CMX. And there's other uh, orchestrators like NSO, which is Network Services Orchestrator. But we're going to focus on APIC-EM in this course. And of course, those are interface with cloud, which will interface with services. So you can see how that all ties together. So again, just to reiterate, so with DNA, you've got cloud, you've got virtualization, you've got controllers. We're going to focus on controllers, specifically with APIC-EM. So getting into APIC-EM, here's kind of a nice uh, simplified architecture of what that looks like. So you've got something called network plug and play, which allows you to dynamically plug in routers and switches, and they will be dynamically configured and run, which is pretty nice, right? No hands-on, uh, zero touch. The next would be IWAN, intelligent routing. So of course, finding the most intelligent way and fastest way to route packets. Uh, the second, the third actually would be path trace. This is a way to debug what's happening on the network. If packets are being dropped, if uh, the network process is not working with APIC-EM, you can specify the source and the destination, and it will tell you where the issue is, right, which is very nice for troubleshooting. Uh, network inventory. So we're going to look at network inventory because, quite honestly, that's the easiest way to get you started, to show you about how to access routers and switches and their state uh, and to track and monitor those. Uh, our focus is going to be on something called northbound REST APIs. Northbound meaning that it sits on top of the controller. Okay? These are REST-based APIs, so again, they're simplified to make it easy for you to access, easy to develop upon. Uh, and underneath that, 
Uh, there's things like role-based access control policy analysis, which policy is pretty useful because that allows you to do things like quality of service control, known as easy quads. Uh, in addition to that, there's other things like topology, getting the monitoring as well as, um, I guess I should say, I don't want to say graphically create the topology, but it provides the information so that you can graphically display the topology through another tool we have called NextUI, which I won't be covering here, but again, you will see that available in the learning labs as well. So a recap on Coding 101. I'm, I'm sort of going quickly because we only have 45 minutes and I want to get through this with you, but again, if you feel behind, you can always pick it up in the learning labs and I'll talk about that. So recap of Coding 101 that you, uh, that you probably already saw. So REST is represents, representational state transfer. It uses the HTTP uh, protocol. It does something called CRUD, which happens with all records. So when you're doing CRUD, you're doing a create a record, you're reading a record, you're updating a record, or you're deleting a record. That's all you do. That's what software engineers do when they're working with records. They do CRUD, right? So in order to do that, you have corresponding methods that are available. So you can do a post, which allows you to create a record. You can do a put, or let me say that right. You want to do a get, which allows you to read a record. You can do a put, which allows you to update a record or delete which allows you to delete. So obviously the fourth one is the easiest to remember. It creates a uh, markup language which is called JSON, which is JavaScript open notation. This is used instead of XML. JSON is less wordy, it's more precise and so forth. That's kind of the invoke thing that people are using now, JSON. So that's what uh, APIC uses as well in terms of data that you send to it and data that it returns. Here's an example of what JavaScript open notation looks like. So you can see here, I just kind of tried to keep this really simple. We have a variable called food. We've got a key called vegetables, and then we've got these values here, carrots, kale, cucumber, tomato. I put them in there because, hey, they're good for you, right? So with the vegetables and the values that follow, this is known as name value pairs. And we've got curly braces around these on the very outside. You see those, right, the curly braces? That's a dictionary, okay? So a dictionary always has a name or a key and a value that follows. So in this particular case, vegetables is a key. The reason why I'm telling you this is because this is really applies to a lot of different things. This helps you out with JSON, it helps you out with Python. That is the key, the vegetables in this case is the key, and the value that follows is this list, which you can see here is in brackets, which is the carrots, cape, kale, cucumber, and tomato, okay? The use of this is that when you're getting data, when you're organizing data and you want to access that data, you need to specify the variable and the key and that gets you to the data that you can then iterate and process through, right? That's what developers do all the time, is they get that data, they know how to access the data through an API reference guide, and then they start processing that data. And I'll show you how that works today, okay? You can also use something called Postman. You guys probably did that in Matt's class before where he was talking about using Postman, which is an HTTP client that you can basically just drop things in, you know, kind of a drag and drop. You enter a little things and you run it. It's not coding, but it's a way to get yourself, your kind of feet wet with that. Now, Postman is not the only HTTP client that's available. There's lots of others, but we like to use Postman because we think it's pretty simple to use. So again, in our labs, you'll see that Postman is available for you to use in our learning labs as well. And of course, we're using Python because Python is kind of the in vogue language. It's not as big as Java, for example, but it certainly is a lot easier to get started with. And especially if you're a network engineer and you want to use development, Python is the way to go because it's very simple. There's no pointers. You don't have to worry so much about objects. There are objects, but you don't have to worry so much about them and so forth. It's an easy way to get started. So getting started. So here's some key URLs that you want to know about, okay? The first one is learninglabs.cisco.com. We've got about almost 150 labs that are available for you to go and access, and they're free. Good price, right? So you can access these labs and you can do learning at your own pace. If you're working through a lab and, and you get busy, you need to do something else, we track state. So if you're in the middle of a lab, you come back to that lab, it'll be in the same state that it was in before, right? So you can do tracking that, you can do learning that way. We have lots of sample code available in a repository on GitHub which is in the Cisco DevNet. So if you go on GitHub Cisco DevNet, you'll see we've got lots of sample code available there for you. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can go through the sample code and start coding from there. You'll find in our learning labs that we reference that sample code. In fact, lots of labs I've written, I said, here's the sample code, run this code, modify this code, here's what your solution should be, right? So you've got places to start and know where you should end with those sample code that's available to you. 
Uh, Postman, if you're not ready to code and you want to just start using the HTTP client Postman, you know, that's not a Cisco product, but it's something that you can easily go and get, right? Just go to getpostman.com, download that, and if you start with our basic learning labs like Coding 101, there'll be a lot of Postman in there, and you can begin working with that just to kind of understand how APIs work, what HTTP is, what are headers, you know, that sort of thing. What's CRUD? All that stuff that I've sort of like ran over here just because this is the next class after that. And the final one is Git. So Git is a tool that allows you to access and create repositories. And this is where you would put your code, you know, when you're writing applications and such, and that's where we put our sample code. In Git, what you can do is there's a download button where you could download stuff and just, you know, access things that way. But what software developers will do is use something called command line. So they open up a window, they type in git command so that they can download the data, either through a clone or through a pull or through a fetch, those sort of things. So this would be a good way for you to begin doing what they do to understand how those processes work and to automate, once you get there, automate, you know, your pushing in, pulling of code and so forth. All right, so setup tools. So the uh, scripts that we've written are all written in Python 3. So of course we recommend that you work with Python 3x. If you have Python 2 on your system and your boss won't let you upgrade, you can run the scripts in Python 2, but there will be situations where you have to make a coding change here or there because you'll get a syntax error. But we prefer Python 3. We think it's going to be simpler for you to use. It's the better way to go. And of course, that's how you would check your version is Python minus V. We also use something called the HTTP request module. This allows you to easily make HTTP calls where you would do a get, a post, a put, or a delete. So it's a very simplified module that we like using, and so you would install that through a uh, packet installer install request, which PIP is the packet uh, manager for, or yeah, the packet uh, manager for Python. Uh, the next thing is that if you decide to use Postman, you can either install Postman directly on your Mac, if you got that. I don't have a Mac. You can just do it on Windows uh, using a Chrome browser if you prefer. Okay, that's what I do. Uh, and again, the uh, REST client, as I was saying, Postman is available on Get Postman. So editor, when you start programming, you might just work with something like Notepad++, which is a freely available Windows editor. I use that a lot, unless I'm doing more complex coding. So that's pretty common. If you're a Linux developer and you're comfortable with VI, you might use that. I, I think it's, it's um, pretty cool once you learn how to use it, but it's kind of got a steep learning curve in terms of getting started with VI. I like to use Eclipse with the PyDev plugin. That's what I use. Uh, there's also PyCharm. There's a free community edition, which is PyCharm. I've heard of Wing IDE. I haven't used it, but I've heard it's really cool. And I know that uh, Python now has something called Idle, which is available, which I want to get familiar with. I haven't tried using it, but I heard that's pretty nice. Again, freely available. So the editors, once you start coding, that are pretty cool to use would be like Eclipse PyCharm, maybe Wing IDE. I'm only talking what other people have told me, and Idle, I-D-L-E, which is available. But again, if you're doing super simple coding, which is what you're going to start doing, you can just use Notepad++ if you're in Windows, or if you're in Linux, you can use VI, or if you're using a Mac, you might use Sublime, you know, something like that. <coughs> so the first thing you're going to do when you're going to download the code is you need to create your source code directory. So what I did, and you'll see this later on, is I created a directory called DevNet Code BR Tiller. Okay? That's all you would do. I'm not going to give you time to do that. Usually when I have lots of time, I say, everybody start doing this, OK? So we can go download the stuff. I'm just going to kind of walk you through it and tell you what I've done. And again, this, this uh, slide deck will be available for you guys to view later on. And of course, we have labs where it will show you the same things that I'm covering here as well. But basically, you're just creating a directory where you're going to put your repo, your repository. The next thing you want to do is that in github.com, Cisco DevNet, we have a repository called Go Coding Skills Sample Code. And that Coding Skills Sample Code uh, is very easy to get. All you have to do is on, after downloading Git, if you do a Git clone, and then you specify this URL that I provided here, that's going to download it directly onto your system. It's a freely, freely available and, and available to the public. So if it asks you for a password, that means that you have a typo in there. So go back and check, because it should not be asking you for a password because it's available to the public. Okay? 
Uh, the other thing that you can do is that, again, if you're not comfortable downloading Git and then using Git on the command line, as I was saying in the repo, you'll see that there's a button there that says download. And if you click on that button, you'll then see another thing that comes up and says download zip file. You can then download that and unzip it if you prefer. But again, that's not the preferred way. The preferred way is to start doing it the way developers do it, which is to download Git and to begin using that command line. But it's certainly up to you. All right, so the learning labs that I'm covering here are going to be the Coding 101 and Coding 102. So again, I sort of went very quickly over Coding 101. Remember I said Coding 101 recap, so that's what that was. All right, but now we're going to go into Coding 102. But when you go into Coding 102 in every lab, there's going to be a tab on top that's going to say how to set up your own computer. It's actually a link. If you click on that, it'll give you the instructions or relay to you to a lab about what you need to do to get your own workstation set up so you can begin working on the labs. It's usually it's usually five minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Install Python, install Git, install requests, you're good to go. So it's usually pretty quick to do that on your system. Now, if you go to our learning labs today and throughout the rest of Cisco Live, they're already set up for you. All right, so you can just go there and just start working. A little disclaimer. If you are a software engineer, you're going to look at our code and say, where is the error checking? How come I don't see any exception handling? Things like that. Because we're simplifying the code for people who are getting started. So we know this isn't real code, right? This is not code you're going to go to production with. This is code that you're using to get your feet wet, right? To understand how coding works, to understand how to use a controller, to begin writing Python. But when you start writing production-ready code, you're going to have to add in your own error checking, your own exception handling, and things like that. So we know that, just so you're aware. All right, so let's do an introduction to Python, all right? So when you install Python on your system, there's a few things that you want to know about and that you're going to want to do. The first thing is to check the version of Python that you have on your system. Pretty simple, right? So what you're going to do is you'll open up a terminal, and you're going to type in on Windows, Python space minus V, capital V. That's going to tell you what version you have. Now, if you have multiple versions of Python on your system on Windows, maybe you've got 2x, maybe you've got 3x, that sort of thing, you're going to need to call out the 3x version. So you'll have to say py space minus 3 space minus V. That tells Python, I want to use version 3. So you would specify that. On Linux or Mac OS 10, you would just say Python 3 minus V. Okay, that gives you the version. Now, Python, of course, has something called an interpreter. So when you write Python code and you're running a script and you call Python, what it does is it has an interpreter that basically reads through that Python and interprets it, right? It does some diagnostics, it reads in the code, it converts it, all that sort of stuff, right? I'm kind of keeping it simple on that. So when you're doing that, when you type in Python in the script name, it's always going to start reading it from the top down. Now, Python has a, a way for you to write code directly in the interpreter if you like. You're going to do simple coding, but it's just a way to get started. So what you can do, for example, in Windows is you would just type just Python. And what it's going to do is it's going to have three angle brackets that basically say, start writing code. So you can start writing code, but again, you're going to have very simple code in there because it, it gets complex pretty quick if you're trying to do for loops or import statements and things like that. So you'll probably just have print statements, maybe conditional statements, just to get comfortable writing Python code. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, so in the Linux or OS 10, you're going to do Python 3. And if you want to exit, you can type quit. Or if you want to move things into the background and then come back to it later, you can do a control Z in Linux. So we're just going to cover some of this because it is a short course. And again, in our learning labs, there's a lot more detail for you. So indentation. So if you've done any coding before, let's say that you did some C coding, you did some shell scripting and everything, you probably notice that when you write code, there's curly braces in your code, right? Curly up here, curly down here. And that is the beginning of a statement block, right? So the beginning of a statement block. This is how it starts. This is how it ends. It's going to have curly braces. Now, in Python, it's a little bit different. It does it through indentation. So all you're doing is if I have an if statement, a conditional statement, and we're going to look at that shortly. So if this, do this. It's going to be anything that's under that is part of that statement. It's part of that conditional statement. So it's very useful. Uh, and that's how it does it in Python. So you have to think in terms of indentation. That indentation can be spaces or it can be tabs. All right? But you need to be consistent. If you start using tabs and you previously were using spaces in that same script, it's going to complain. It's going to say, I don't know what that is. 
right? You're not being consistent. So you need to use one or the other when you're doing it. There's data types. We're going to take a look at data types. So there's some key data types you need to know about. And the cool thing about learning these data types, in particular lists and dictionaries, is that these same things are used in JSON. So if you learn how to do it in Python, remember I talked a little bit about JSON, and you need to parse JSON data. If you understand how to do it in Python, you're going to understand how to do it in JSON. So it's great how it transfers. The reason is that they're handled the same way in terms of parsing the data. So you learn one, you learn the other. Okay? Statements. So there's import statements. Import statements if you want to import a Python module. In other words, you want to get use of that module to use its functions. You're going to use an import statement. You're going to see that shortly. Print statements. I want to print my data to the screen. Pretty simple. So I'm just going to say print this. Conditional statements. If this, do that. Right. So again, I'm filtering data. And again, I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. We're not going to cover looping in functions uh, because there's just not enough time. Otherwise, I would. But again, you can pick all that stuff up in the learning labs. Here's an example of what this looks like. Python indentation. There's a lot covered here. So let's just talk about this. So the first thing is that I have a print statement. Hello world. This is my first hello world app. Now it's a little bit more, slightly more complex than your first hello world app because that's where it would end, right? But I want to show you more than that. So we're doing a variable assignment. I have a variable that I decided to call num. I could have called it Brett. I could have called it Cisco. I could have called it most other things. There are a few rules like no spaces in between and so forth, but I just called it num because I wanted to. I thought it made sense since I'm assigning a num value to it, right? Now I have a conditional statement, if num is less than 1. Notice a few things here in this statement. So the first thing is that I've got a colon at the end of that. Important syntax note, right? The other thing is that num was assigned the value of 1. So I have is if 1 is less than 1. It's not, right? 1 is not less than 1. It's false. So this statement evaluates to false. That means that everything that is under that, that's indented under that statement block, will not be executed. Right, because it's evaluated to false. Okay, so in this case, when I run this script, what's going to happen is only hello world is going to be printed. We start from the top down. There's nothing to prevent hello world from being printed. There's no condition there. It's always going to get printed. Right? But the next ones are not. I'm less than one and goodbye cruel world are not going to be printed because one is not less than one. Now, if I made a change and I assign the num value equal to zero, now we do a check again. If num is less than 1, we know that num is 0. We also know that 0 is less than 1, right? So because 0 is less than 1, this statement evaluates to true. That means everything under this statement block is going to be executed. Therefore, when I run this script, I'm going to print hello world. I'm going to print I'm less than 1. And I'm going to print goodbye cruel world. Again, because this conditional statement evaluates to true. And also, again, because these print statements here are indented underneath that conditional statement, which means that they're subject to that condition. They're owned by that conditional block, right? Now, what I could also do is, let's say I decided that I wanted to unindent one of these statements. Let's say on Goodbye Cruel World that I unindented that. I moved it all the way to the left, right? So now it's in line with print, num, and if, right? It's no longer subject to the constraints of the if conditional statement, all right? So if I ran this, and let's just say my script was as it currently is, num is equal to 1, but again, envision that goodbye cruel world is pushed out to the left, so it's no longer indented underneath this uh, statement block. Now what's going to happen is I'm always going to print hello world, right? There's nothing to prevent it from happening. Num is assigned a value 1. This check here, if num is less than 1, evaluates to false, so I'm not going to print I'm less than 1, right? Because it evaluates to false, and it's underneath that uh, it's indented under that conditional block. But I will print goodbye cruel world. And again, because that was unindented, it's no longer subject to those constraints. So you should have a sense here of scope, right? That if I'm indented, I'm sub under a block, under a conditional statement. In that case, under other things. It can be a function, it can be a loop. I'm subject to those constraints, to those laws underneath that particular statement, OK? If I'm not, I'm kind of independent. I do it on my own. Right? So I'm not subject to those constraints. All right, so let's talk about data types, and then I'm going to show you some examples of what those look like. So numeric data types are going to be like an int and a float. So for our purposes, we're going to say that an int is a whole number. So it can be negative 5,000, it could be 1, it could be 50, it could be 100, that sort of thing. A float is going to be something with a decimal in it. Again, there's other restrictions, but we'll do it for our purposes. 
In terms of Boolean, we're not going to worry about logical operators. We just want it, we only care about true and false. Okay? So true and false. So they are case sensitive. I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. So you'll see what I'm referring to when I mean true or false. Uh, text. So these are otherwise known as strings. If I have a single or a double quote around something, it's now a string. It's now text. Data types. So lists. When you define a list, a list is defined with a bracket, a beginning bracket and an ending bracket. This is a list. That's how I define a list. Okay? And I can pretty much put anything inside of that list. So I can put numbers, I can put booleans, I can put text, I can put, as I was mentioning, strings, which are the same thing as text. So for example, let's say I was creating a list. I create a list and I said L, which is my variable, equals bracket, and now I'm beginning my list. And then I say 1, comma, 2, comma, and maybe I put my name in there for fun. I'm going to have a quote, Brett, end quote, end bracket. I just created a list with three elements in it. Okay? It's defined because of the brackets. That's what you need to remember. There's a couple things you have to commit to memory, is that when you have a square bracket beginning and ending, that is a list. Okay? A list can be modified. It's mutable. So it means it can be changed. All right? Tuple. Tuple is pretty much just like a list with a couple exceptions, all right? So the exceptions are this. It's not mutable. It cannot be changed. So it's very efficient to use. It's defined with parentheses. Rather than a square bracket, we're going to use parentheses. And normally, when you create a tuple, you want associated data. So for an example, if I was going to create a tuple, I might say parentheses, and maybe I put my name in here, quote, Brett, end quote. Maybe I put a 10 in here, and then I put a quote, Cisco end quote, end parentheses. It's associated data. I've been at Cisco for 10 years. My name is Brett, right? So it's all associated data. Immutable data cannot be changed, OK? Mapping. So mapping is a little bit different. A little bit different. When I'm using dictionaries, as I was talking about a little bit earlier, when I went over that review about vegetables, remember I talked about vegetables? And said kale, carrot, cucumber, good for you, that kind of stuff. So you always have a name and a value which are separated by a colon. A dictionary is defined by curly braces. So you always have a beginning curly brace and an ending curly brace. And you're always going to have a name or otherwise known as a key and then a value that follows that. That value can be a string. It can be a list. It can be a diction another dictionary. That's very common. It can be a, a tuple, for example. Not as common, but it can certainly be that. And we'll, we'll look at more of that pretty soon. So let's look at some examples of what that looks like. So the data types. We've got the data types uh, on the left, and we've got examples on the right. So an integer and a float. right? Integer, again, our purpose is it's a whole number. And notice I've got some variables in here to get you comfortable with that. So I have x equals 10. That's my integer assignment. Right? Now x is equal to the value of 10. I have x equals 1.0. So I'm assigning a float now to this, to this uh, variable x. String. So I've got single quotes. I could also use double quotes, where I have x equals Mike, right? It could be single quotes, or it could be double quotes for that. Boolean. So again, for our purposes, we're just keeping it simple here. I've got true or false. It is case sensitive, so you need to specify just the way it looks, right? So it has to be a capital T or a capital F, lowercase everything else. When I'm defining a list, so I've got, I can put numbers in here. I could put strings, and again, they are brackets that define that list. Okay? I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to tell you a little bit different stuff in a second, but I want to get you comfortable with this. All right? My tuple. So again, tuple, the same as list as far as we're concerned, with some notable exceptions. They cannot be changed, so they're immutable. Right? They have associated data, typically, and they're defined with, curly, with uh, parentheses. With parentheses. Okay? A dictionary. So I've got a dictionary here. So again, they're defined with curly braces. They always have name or a key. It's the same thing. And then you have a value that follows. Dictionaries are also known as maps. They're also known as associative arrays. It's the same thing, right? They just call them different stuff. So here's an example here. So I have my DICT equals my key here is 1, which I've spelled out, O and E. And then I've got 2, which I've spelled out. Those are both the keys in there. Now, I could have used a number as a key if I wanted to. I just didn't put it in my example. My value here is the number one and then also the number two that I have in there. 
So you want to notice the syntax, right? So to notice the syntax in terms of the curly brace, defining a dictionary, and then I've got a colon in between each of these where I have one colon, the number one, I've got two colon, the number two, and for each record in here, I have a comma. So I can have a bunch of them, right? I could have 10,000 of them, but of course, we're keeping this simple, okay? And of course, you can have nested data. So I have an example here of showing you a list in a list. You might have a list in a dictionary. You might have a dictionary in a list, that sort of thing. But again, just bear in mind, this is not, this is not rocket science in terms of any, it's English, right? So it's pretty easy to read. You just need to understand what the syntax is and how this stuff works. One more thing I should mention. Let me see if I got in this slide. Nope. Okay. So two more things, three more things I actually want to mention. So notice here that when I have listed, I have a bracket. When I've got a tuple, I have parentheses. And when I have a dictionary, I've got the, um, I've got the curly braces. Now, when I'm accessing the data, that, those things that I just showed you define those data types. But when I access that data, I'm going to do it all in the same manner. And the same manner is, is I'm going to use brackets. So for example, when I'm looking at a list, notice here, let's just use this example here. 10, 20, 30. If I want to actually get the value 10, get the value 20, or get the value 30 out of that, there's a few things I need to know. The first thing is that this data is always in sequential order. It always starts at the count of zero. So what does that mean? That means 10 is an element zero. 20 is an element one. 30 is an element three. If I had Brett that followed, he'd be element four. If I had Susie, you know, that would be element five. Right? So that sort of thing. So it's always sequential. So if I wanted to access, let's say, the value of 20 in this list, I would say, I have to specify the variable, so I would say my list, bracket, and then I would say one, end bracket. And the reason is because 20 is in the first space, right? Because we always start at zero. So it's in the one, th I'm going to say one th space there. So zero, one, two, three is how you access those. A tuple is the same. Tuple is the same way. It gets accessed the same way. So I have my tuple. If I wanted to get the value Cisco, or let me just change it. Let's say I want to get the value carry, just to show you something a little different. So I would have my tuple bracket, and then I would say zero, one, two. So I would say two and bracket, and that's going to return carry. And I'm going to show you an example of that pretty shortly. Okay? A dictionary. So a dictionary is a little bit different because, again, as I was saying, that's not sequential data type. You have key value pairs. All right? So in a dictionary, I have to specify what that key is to get the value. So in this case, if I wanted to get the value of 2, for example, I would say my underscore D-I-C-T. And again, I'm still going to use the bracket because I'm accessing data, right? I'm accessing data. And then this one, I would say, quote, 2, end quote, end bracket, and that's going to return the value of 2. OK? So let me show you how that all works so you can see how this all comes together here. All right, now let me make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see this. Is that big enough? You want it bigger? That's good? OK. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create a list. So in, uh, I'm just going to say, first thing I need to do is get into the Python interpreter. Remember I said you can do the Python interpreter? So now I'm in the Python interpreter. Now I can start writing code. Okay? Now again, it's going to be simple code. I'm not going to write complex code here because it gets through your real mess, believe me, if you try to do it here. But I'm going to show you some simple stuff. All right, so let's say I want to create a list. I'm going to say L equals, I've just begun creating a list. There's my bracket right there. Just started creating a list. Okay? And I'll put my name in there for fun. Maybe I'm going to put a number in here. And maybe I'm going to put, oops. And maybe I'm going to put in, I don't know, we'll say uh, Cisco Live. And the year is 2017. And just to, for fun, I'm going to also show you that I can put a number in here and make that a string too. Okay? Now, the first thing, 
is that if I say type L, you can see that Python knows that this is a list, right? And it knows it's a list because of the bracket that I have at the beginning and the end. So Python says, ah, I know this is a list. You've just assigned to variable L this list. All right, so now I want to access the data. So why don't I go ahead and I'm going to say print. And again, my variable is L, right? That's what I just assigned it. And remember, when I access data, I always use an angle or a bracket when I access the data. So I have to do that for tuples. I have to do that for the dictionaries, right? It's the same. And if I want to get, and again, it's sequential. So if I said zero, this is going to print out Brett, right? If I change this and I said one, you should know that this is going to print out the value of three. If I said two, we know that this is going to print out the value of Cisco Live. What if I went too far? What if I said seven? Ah, Python is smart. It says, well, you didn't define anything in element space seven. There's nothing there, so this is out of range, right? So the cool thing about a developer, and I've, I've been developing for a long time, is that it's designed to help you, right? It's not going to say, hey, you idiot, I'm not going to tell you where your problem is. You figure it out. No. It tells you, hey, you did something wrong here. It, you, the, your index is out of range, right? So it's designed to help you get this stuff done, OK? So let's go back to this, and let me show you a tuple. Press the wrong button here. All right, so let's define a tuple. So maybe I'm just going to call this tuple, again, just because it makes sense to call it that. So I'm defining a tuple. I need to do that with parentheses. All right, and again, this is going to be associated data. That's what you normally want to put in here. So I'm going to say something like Brett, Cisco, and 10, since I've been there 10 years. And if I do type tuple, again, it knows it's a tuple because of the parentheses, not because my variable name is tuple, right? It knows it because of the parentheses. And then if I want to access the data, I do it the same way as I do a list, right? So I'm going to say print. And I need to specify my variable name, which is two. And if I say zero, starting at the zero element, it's going to print Brett. So again, you have an idea how this works. And we say one. And if I said two, of course, it's going to print out the last one. And the same idea, if I went too far, it's going to say there's nothing there. You're out of range. Okay? Dictionary a little bit different. Right, because of dictionary. So we know the tuples and lists are very similar, right? We, we define them a little bit differently, but we access them the exact same way. So very similar. One is mutable, which is the list. One is not, which is the tuple. Okay? But let's look at the dictionary. So I'm just going to call this D, and I'm going to define this with a curly brace, which is here. And in here, I'm going to have to create some name value pairs, right? So I have to have a name, I have to have a value. So maybe in this case, I'm going to create a value or a, a key, otherwise known as a name. There's my key right there, and now I have to have a value that follows. And maybe I'll just put a number here just for fun. Okay? So I have a key of green, its value is five. Now, it doesn't have to be a string. I could also make it a number. So let's say in this next uh, record here, I'm going to put in the value of 8. That's my key. And maybe I decide here that the, uh, it's going to be red. Or I could just use numbers if I want to. So I could say something like 5. This is my next one. And maybe this is 10. OK? So I just define a dictionary. Now, let's do a type D. Again, because of the curly braces, it knows it's a dictionary. But accessing the data, a little bit different. I still use my bracket, right? So I'm going to say print, so I can print this to the screen. And then I'm going to say D, and now I have to say bracket, and I'm going to say green. This is going to give me my value that's in there. So it prints out five, right? Five minutes? Wow, that was quick. OK, and let me just show you two more things, and then we'll go on to the next thing. That was fast. OK. Uh, and then we've got, let's say I want to print D, and then I'm going to specify 5. 
Now notice this is not the fifth element. This is actually going to be the key, so this prints out 10. Okay, now it is, case, it is um, type sensitive. So if I said, if I made this into a string, this five into a string, it says, no, no, there is no key that's a string data type of five. It's only numeric, right? So the data type is sensitive. It's also case sensitive. So if I up arrow on this one, and I said this was green with a capital G, it says, ah, there's nothing that exactly matches that. So it is case sensitive, right? So it's data type sensitive, it's case sensitive. So you need to be aware of that, OK? All right, I've got five minutes left, so I'm going to jump to the next one. Let's see how many slides we have left here. Yikes. All right, so we're going to kind of go through this. But I want to emphasize that even though I'm running out of time here, that you can pick all this stuff up at our learning labs, which you can do here. You can do it on your own time, learninglabs.cisco.com. But I want to kind of race through this because I want to show you what you learn. OK? So we have an import statement. This is the first time you're seeing this, so this you're just learning right now. I want to import the use of the request module. That's why I say import. Now, if you go all the way down here, I have response equal request.post. So you should notice from there that now I'm using the data, the functions in the request module. That's why it's there. Okay? Import JSON. I want to use this JSON module. And again, if you look on request.post down here, you'll see that there's a call json.dumps. So I'm using the functions inside the JSON module. That's the reason why I've imported that. I've got my, my uh, variable called URL, and in here I'm specifying, this is for APIC-EM specifically, I've got my controller here, sandbox.cisco.com, sandbox.apic.cisco.com. That's the DevNet always on APIC-EM controller. You can access that anytime you want. We have that available for use in, of course, in the learning labs and such. Here what I'm specifying is I want to get a ticket. APIC-EM uses authentication, and you have to get a service ticket so you can make function calls. All right, now what I'm doing is I have to pass in a user password so I can make those calls. So you might notice here, I've got curly braces here. I'm creating a dictionary with name value pairs, right? So my key here is username, my value is devnet user, my next key is password, my value is cisco123bang, right? Now I have a header. So in the header, I'm specifying to the server, hey, I'm about to pass you JSON data. I have to tell the server what kind of data I'm sending it, otherwise it's going to say, you gave me data, I don't know what this is. So I'm saying, the data I'm sending you is content type, application JSON, it's JSON data, the slash JSON tells it that, okay? And now I'm doing a post because I want it to create a ticket. So remember CRUD, right? Create, read, update, delete. Post does a create. I need a ticket created that I can use so I can make other function calls. So now I've got request.post. I'm passing in this data here. I'm passing in the header. I've got something here called verify false. We're using that because we're not doing any SSL checking, no socket secure layer checking. In the real world, you wouldn't want that, but we're doing it to keep it simple, right? So we've got verify false here. That's why that's there. And again, you'll see all this stuff in the learning labs should you decide to go ahead and use that. And then here I'm just printing this out. So again, you've, you've kind of looked at the data types. You have a sense of what that is. You know what we're doing with the import. You know we're doing a post because we want to create a ticket. Let's see here. Do I have time to run that? Let's see what's left. OK, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what your assignment would have been, and I'm going to go back and do the demo. Okay? So this is what your assignment would have been, and you'll be doing this in the lab if you decide to do that, is that there's a function here or a um, script called getnetworkhost.py. And what this would do is that this goes out and gets all the network hosts in the network, which is pretty cool because you want to know what the status is of the network, right? What's happening with my host? You can also get network devices, the routers and switches. Am I having a problem with the interface? Is there something I need to modify here? So again, you can do all this stuff programmatically, which is the whole value of APIC-EM. You can now do this dynamically. You don't have to manually type it in the CLI, which we've all done in the past, right? And then what I'm showing here is that then you can parse this data because what I would be returning to you is a dictionary, and I would ask you to parse it just the way I showed you how to parse it. And again, you'll want to get comfortable with that. I don't expect you to pick this all up at once. OK, I'm going to go forward, and then I'm going to go backward. Final thoughts? So you're going to go to, if you want to get the repo, it's on GitHub, Cisco DevNet. Coding skills, sample code repositories, where all this sample code is available for you. 
The Learning Labs are learninglabs.cisco.com. Again, they're freely available for you here today, but you can do them anytime you want on learninglabs.cisco.com. There is an APIC-EM programmability track, so you can get comfortable with APIC-EM itself, and that's in our tracks. If you go to learninglabs.cisco.com, you'll see there's a tracks link, and then you can click on that track, and it'll provide all the labs to you and say, okay, start on this lab. So now you can begin learning this. With DevNet, if you want to learn more about specific technologies, hey, I kind of like this APIC-EM. You can go to developer.cisco.com, click on networks, and you'll see APIC-EM along with a slew of other technologies, but the one I'm covering is APIC-EM. Select that, and there'll be all this stuff available for you in terms of the API reference guide, how it works, uh, more about the architecture, and all that sort of thing. And the DevNet zone, again, is here. The Learning Lab's right over there, so please come see us. Uh, there's an online session evaluation. Please complete that. Let me know if I went too fast. Maybe I did, or maybe I went at the right speed. You know? Uh, let's see. Yeah, there is a meet the engineer one-on-one -on -one meetings. So if you'd like to meet with me, please schedule that. Uh, there's also lunch and learn, walk and self-paced labs. And I'm going to back up. While I'm doing this demo, if there's any quick questions, I'd be happy to, to uh, answer your questions. Is there any questions? before I do this demo? Nope. All right. So let's do this demo then. So I said before that I like Eclipse. So that's actually over here, not there. So I've got my script right here, Get Network Devices. I'm just going to quickly run through this and show you. This is kind of what I just talked about, right? So I'm getting a ticket. I've got API v1 ticket getting network devices. If I went ahead and ran this, you're going to see below that there's a bunch of data that gets returned. So let me bring up this data. So this is the original data that gets returned. This is JSON data. You guys see the curly braces in here? We know that this is in dictionary format, right? Because there's curly braces here. These are all the records that get returned. Now, normally, these records are all munged together, but I've done something called pretty, fin pretty print so you can see them all separated. It makes it easy to see how this works, right? So we have a warning because I'm doing a verify false and not using SSL, but we're not going to worry about that. This is a response data. So I have a variable here that, um, well, I printed out network devices. And then notice that the key here is response. And notice that follows there we have a list, otherwise in JSON known as an array. And then we have dictionaries inside of those, otherwise in JSON known as objects. Okay? And what I can do is I could parse this data. I can access and parse this data and then I can use this data. Maybe I'm checking the status. Maybe I'm looking for the MAC address. Maybe I'm trying to determine what the role is. These type of things. So down here, what I've done, and this is what you would be doing, is I would be parsing out some of that data. So here's what I did is I parsed out the MAC address and just the name and just the state of that particular device. So again, if I were a developer and I was tracking this, I would say, now, I'm going to tell you just ahead of time, this stuff's all in a database. This is not a real network. We're keeping this simple, right? But of course, if I was a developer and I saw that this is a real problem, <laughs> but devices aren't reachable, right? So now I need to instigate something to find out why my devices aren't reachable. But it, for our purposes, we're just parsing out this data. So how did I parse this data? How much time do I have, Paul? I'm over. OK, so let me just show you one quick thing about how I parse this data. So I have a loop here, and it says right here, this is it right here. This is how this data got parsed. Okay, So I have the variable, and I'm specifying response, and now I'm just iterating through the data and just printing it out. Notice what I'd like you to take away, because I know this is rather complex, is that I have I ID. The key is ID. I'm getting that value. Okay, And then here I have I series. Right? So series is the key. And again, I'm getting that particular value for the series. And then reachability. And if I show you how I know that, this will be the last thing. Let's just look at one record. There's series. Notice there's a key there, series. There's the value that follows. Here's ID down here. 
So again, I just specified ID, the variable and ID. That's how I got that value there, reachability status. That's how I got it, it's right there. Right, it gave me the value for that. So that's how I was able to parse that data, is that you're going to know what those values are because there'll be something called an API reference guide that says these are the values that you should expect, and then you just parse those values. Okay? Again, I know I was really quick, so I'd like you, if you want to continue your learning, certainly go to the labs and uh, begin processing that. Right? You can start with coding 101, go to that APIC EM track that I talked about, and then just move forward from there. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you.